yearlings. They're like teenagers getting advice from your best friend that doesn't have six cents about financial stuff. So if he wants any action, he's got to go down there. That right there are uh, poisonous to cattle. That if people wanted actually more numbers of grizzly bears, they would allow hunting for large old boars. Old boars eat a lot of cubs every year. Oh, here's a school bus. I'm sorry, the dog's crapping. So what cattle have really done then is taken the place of the largest ungulate, which is buffalo. There are at least a thousand things that college missed about nature. The way to learn about nature is right here, living and breathing and dealing with the responsibilities of nature on your life. Join Scott, Jay, and I as we reveal some of the truths that we've learned from living and breathing and working in nature. A rancher's work is never done. So today, after we moved some cows, we'll be able to do all sorts of cool stuff with your cowboy hat. Right. <laughs> and then we're going up to the top of the mountain. Go check a couple gates and make sure that they haven't gotten down because there's a couple of neighbor's cows in one of Scott's pastures. So we're gonna go make sure that we close them gates to protect that grass. Grass is a commodity and you want to protect that. Otherwise you don't make any money on it. When you uh, clean out a pasture, <laughs> this is what happens is, whoop. You clean out a pasture, you got a bull here and a couple cows over there, a couple calves over there. We were just talking about it. You never get them all. You just try to get as many as you can and then you're gonna have to come back and get the rest at some point, but usually two or three times through a pasture and you'll find most of your cows. Yeah, well, you wanna stick these through here? Oh, I've got a couple more. Oh, gotcha. That park in a puddle? Look at all the, what is this called? Water. I know. <laughs> yeah, Montana has mud right now. Actually, so I was doing some studying about the, like the decline of the buffalo. Trying to do some videos on that. Decimation of the buffalo, we'll call it that. I always thought the government did it to spare the Indians out actually, but. But actually what happened was really the, the way the buffalo got decimated was really just capitalism at work with no regulations. Because buffalo hides were just worth a ton of money Buffalo hides were worth so much money, you could come out here and just like make it a literal fortune yeah. shooting yeah. buffalo yeah. all day. And no, they didn't regulate it at all. So this is wet here. <laughs> yes, it is. He's just pushing a couple of these pears out into the bottom pasture, which is where we started today. Is this where you came out of yesterday? Yeah, this is where this uh, in the flow. So they kind of cleaned this one out yesterday and then pushing them down to that one, which we cleaned out yesterday before. That's Dave. You saw him in a previous video and he's putting out salt. Oh, there's a bull coming down. I see that. All right. <laughs> we'll go get him. I see. And then, but up above this is where it gets up to where they call Shonkin Peak. Okay. And then all the Raspberry Cooley and Tilly Gulch, and it opens up into their, their mountain range. Uh huh. There's, there's not very many cows left, so if he wants any action, he's got to go down there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <That's for sure. laughs> there's only just a few cows left in the pasture up here. But bulls, bulls above even way over cows they like to hold in in the brush and uh, not move very much so during the day when you move the cows a lot of times they'll get stuck in the brush or something and just hold up there so they figure out they're all by themselves and sometimes they they, start to move. they can and as they get older they get worse to move they just in fact I there was a guy up in Battle Creek and there was a bull up there and that same bull stayed up there for about six years Wow. Never could get him out. Wow. They tried to get him out and they just he just stayed up there all winter long. Wow. Sometimes it gets where it's not worth it. Yeah, exactly. Hey bull. Oh. Here's the rest of them. Did you bring your irrigation boots? <laughs>
Well, you you push him to this side and we'll see if we can get him through the gate. I was just saying that in a, in a different video that uh, when you drop a gate, you can drop the gate on a cow like that and they can just walk right over because their, th their hide is literally like that thick. If a horse were to walk through there, he'd immediately get all the way cut to his nose because he's got, they got paper thin skin, horses do. They barely made it up here. You can see there's a big bed there, probably a moose or elk or, like a yearling. or a yearling. It's a pretty big bed. Yearlings might be a great way exact. To I think yeah. so. Yeah. I think they are because you don't have to own the cattle during the winter time. So exactly. my head explodes when I think about running yearlings. Just yeah. So running yearlings means you buy calves that are weanlings and you raise them until they're a year old or just over a year old then you sell them directly to a feedlot and they feed them up because you don't butcher cattle until they're a year and eight months a year and ten months old usually sometimes even longer depending on how you finish them so it's nice some places just do that so they buy calves in the in the spring they run them for until late fall and then sell them and then they don't have any cows on their plate during the winter time so they don't have to calve anything they don't have to feed anything the problem is is areas like this so basically if you're running yearlings they're like teenagers and they're all teenagers so they, they don't have cows with them anymore so there's no adult supervision let's <laughs> say so your yearlings are like a bunch of teenagers that are following each other like getting advice from your best friend that doesn't have six cents about financial stuff <laughs> so when you're so all of them will just take off and go everywhere and you can't get them you can't really herd them very well they they, just, they don't really know how to follow anything like when you're moving pairs pairs is cows and calves the cows are old enough and they've been up and down a few times they know when a horse comes on this side of them they move this way well calves don't know that so you take the cows away and you just have the calves and they see a horse, they'll run right past the horse and go up the hill and round. They don't have any idea. So it, getting them in here would take 50 people to get 100 head out of here. Because there's so many places to hide. They can go over a hill. They can be in the brush. They, I mean, it'd be a wreck. It'd be a lot of work. So when you're out in eastern Montana and your pastures are more flat or level, you got places where you can have really good fences which you need and you don't have elk tearing them down and everything all the time then you can run yearlings much easier this kind of stuff really hard to do unless you're you want to be a real cowboy and spend all your time chasing cows around everywhere in the saddle riding every day yeah, yeah, all, all the time every single day yeah and have people call you from 10 miles away because there's big yearlings over there they, they travel a lot further too Looks fantastic, yeah, doesn't looks it? Nice looks right. Pretty this good year. Pretty good, but I mean, this location is. I've met a lot of people around the state, and you tell them where you're at, and they look at you and you go, "Oh, you guys get moisture all the time." And you know, some most years we do really well for mo for moisture. So a lot of years we have grass like this. Yeah. Maybe not quite this good, but most years it's pretty incredibly good. You know, Montana is so different because where I was in on the on the border of Wyoming, you would think you were in Arizona <laughs> just the other day, and, and yet right here, 200, well, I don't know, maybe, well, it's about 250, 300 miles away, huh? in, in Montana is this. It, it's very vast. Montana is very vast and has lots of different variation in ground. Is named after Shonkanite Rock. Shonkanite Rock geologically is one of the deepest, comes up from deeper in the Earth's core than, than a lot of rocks that they know of. They've had people come from as far as Russia 
to study the Shonkanite rock in the Iwood areas. Really? Yeah, like there's a there's a so, town there's a town called Shonkin on the other side. Yeah, I've heard of it. I've heard of the town Shonkin. So the the vein of rock goes down a long way. There? Comes from so deep. Okay. It comes from so far down. Those look yeah. like my yearlings, don't they? So you do have some yearlings in here. Oh, I do. Well, they're not supposed to be in here. Oh, the yearlings are not okay. supposed to be in here, but they're over there. That's. <laughs> and tomorrow I'll show you where they started. It's I about see. Four miles from here. <laughs> that was three or four days ago. So. All right. So I suppose you try to keep your yearlings a little closer to, to the bottom, lower down where you can oh, lower up the pasture or what? No, that's, that's a work in progress. Oh, okay. Hence, hence they're up here. That's correct. Yeah. <laughs> we used to have a pasture further up than we leased. Probably, it's actually further into the mountains than where our forest cattle go. And we always put them up there. And it was just one of the places that we had to not do this year. I see because of numbers from the drought last year and other things yeah just couldn't couldn't do that yeah so we put them in somewhere else and then they ended up here <laughs> we put them in somewhere else and they ended up four miles away from where they're supposed to be i'll show you i'll show you which is what yearlings do literally if you had if you put 100 yearlings here and tried to keep the fence but you didn't you didn't go find them all the time you'd have you'd have yearlings 15 miles from here the pasture in the, that we in the, normally by the fall, been, I would have to take the truck and trailer all the way around to Geyser at least once a year and get yearlings. Oh, okay. Take a three-hour trip around the mountain. Yeah, just for a couple of yearlings. So this isn't uh, lupine, is it? It is. It is lupine. Yeah. So that right there, the 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 purple flowers are. Uh, poisonous to cattle yes kind of like a uh, local weed they make them go insane also causes birth defects and causes birth defects it's called lupine every once in a while we'll have a calf in the winter and we'll, we'll if he's really you know weird call him a loopy calf they just i don't know if that's what it is the, the cow has to eat it at the right time of the plant's development and the fetus has to be at the right stage in development to cause an abnormality, but it does happen. Yeah. So they're kind of like drug addicts, but it is pretty, right? They are pretty. They are pretty. And on a year like this with a lot of grass, cows are smart. They won't graze it. Yeah. They'll they really only eat that bad stuff like local weed and lupine exactly. when they're when it's all dry and and it's about the only thing green because they stay green longer for some reason. We've climbed a little bit. Climbed a bit, yeah. Like Tanner always says, I'm really sorry about the view. I apologize. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's sorry you had to put up with it. It's hideous to look around up here, but you know, it's the life of the. Yeah. On a clear day, we've got a little bit of haze. On a clear day, you can watch the front range go all the way to Browning. Well, not watch, but you can see where it goes to Browning. Oh, okay. And the the front, the Mount, Rocky Mountain front. Yep. And you can generally see, you can't see Fort Benton, but you can see Carter. You can see the um, Sweetgrass Hills really well on a clear day. Yep. One of the reasons I think that they call this the Big Sky Day is, you know, when you get to a flat land, it's hard to see something. You can see it very far. It doesn't look like it's very far when you're on flat ground, but if you get on on something that's got some mountains and stuff you can see for 35 40 miles so it just you're seeing such vast distances that you're seeing more of the sky it seems like yeah. well like the sweet grass hills i mean they're west of haver yeah that's two hours from here so i mean we're you're looking at hundreds of miles yeah hundreds of miles right so on a clear day you can see what well, yeah almost a can Almost Canada, which would be like a hundred miles. That, that's a long way. You're seeing a ton of distance. Unlike where I was last week, this place doesn't really have much for grizzly bears yet, but they're, I'm sure they're starting to move over into this country. They have to grow all the way across that whole plain of 40 or 50 miles to get here. And they're just starting to do it. 
it's interesting that if people wanted actually more numbers of grizzly bear, they would allow hunting for large old boars. Old boars eat a lot of cubs every year. So if you actually kill the old boars, which they do in Canada sometimes, and actually increases the population of grizzly bears because you have a, a lot higher survival rate for the cubs. It's just a fact. Yeah, absolutely. You know, a couple of things that they that people don't understand is numbers. So they hear, oh, there's only a thousand grizzly bears. Okay. There's estimated to be over 1,000 grizzly bears in just this area of Montana. In the That's same, great for in the the same area that there is, what would you say, you know, let's say 10,000, 15,000 elk, maybe more, right? So it sounds like, well, we're way out of whack here. The problem is predators cannot occupy the same amount of ground right. as a herd animal. More Who, who's a grazer? Equal better. Who's a grazer? Right, exactly. You don't have herds of grizzly bears because they eat meat. They eat, well, they're kind of an omnivore, but they need meat. Get that herds. So, I mean, Different. yeah. <laughs> so you can't have the same amount of bears as you. So a thousand grizzly bears covers an enormous amount of area. And, and they're actually overlapping way too much. And that's why you're having like bears killing each other and all that kind of stuff. So it you can't. You can't apply the same number of thought process with wolves, especially wolves, because they only eat meat. So there, you have to have a meat supply for everything. If you had, a, you had 15,000 wolves and 15,000 ungulates, you will have no ungulates in about a month. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I hope I'm actually saying ungulates right. Is that is that the word for? <laughs> That, yeah, that's what an elk is, right? Ungulate, ungulate. So whose cows are those down there? Those are my neighbors. Oh, that's the neighbor's cow. cows, okay. So now you're looking down into Shonkin Creek. Okay. There's the road, you can see the county road there. That's a gravel road, goes all the way through uh, yep. Big Sag Ranch and around to Geraldine. Way out there. Uh, it's, no, it's nothing. Oh, here's a school bus. This is the bus? Uh -huh. This is the bus. So somebody drove that up here at some point. When they got done logging up here, Dave hooked up to it with the D6 and drug it up here. Oh, really? Locked it up and made a little spike camp. Gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then we had a couple guys from church come up and they mucked it all out and sealed all the tracks and mouse proofed it, put a little stove in there. They hunted out of here a lot of years until until the one gentleman passed away. but. So I don't know if you could hear that, but he said that they drug this up here with a, a D6 uh -huh. cap. So when they put in the log in, they actually put in this road, which, I mean, it's so harmful to the environment, this road is, you can tell. But, they, so they drug this up here. That had to be pretty hairy, even even with that. But um, So they made it into kind of a spike camp cabin deal. It's got a stove in there. It might be a fly or two. Ooh, there might be some flies. Ooh, a couple. Wow. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, so yeah. Got some hardwood. Look floor. at that. You got a little tiny bit of hardwood floor. Where's where do you sleep in here? On here? Yeah. Yeah, two Throw two bunks. On two bunks and... and they got a wood stove with no pipe. Well, there's the pipe right there. The, pipe off, no, so the pipe's right here. Yeah, so it goes out the top and then a gas stove and a little sink i don't know if that works but cool yeah would be a nice little place to to camp Ow. there's a there we go a thing on the top of the door to to get it to latch Oh, oh. There's a little, a little pin. Oh, I see. I need just now shut it and then it sticks. To it. There. I gotcha. That just holds it shut. Yep, you got it. When this poly pipe comes apart, it's so on these high mountain pastures for cattle, usually we have a tank or something because if you don't have a tank, they have to get the water through, That's through the true. ground and then they stomp it all over the place. So. 
It's running pretty good though. It's okay. Oh yeah. Yeah, that'll freeze your hand pretty fast. I wouldn't want to swim in it, that's for sure. It'd be a little more than refreshing. And then salt right here that they brought up. So salt, because a lot of this area, even the wildlife has to find salt licks. And what they'll do is they'll find where the salt is heavy in the ground. And you'll see them, they'll stomp and paw like a big area and then lick the dirt. And uh, that's just them finding minerals to supplement what they're not getting out of the grass. So for cattle, they actually bring up salt with minerals in it to supplement the cattle. Otherwise, they'll start to lose weight even no matter how much grass they get. Got to have salt. I'm going to... Is it drinkable? Very, very drinkable. It's very drinkable. Look at that. Right out of the ground, probably. You hike straight up this valley a couple hundred yards, there's a makeshift spring box and this comes right out of the rock. Okay. Funny that it comes out of the rock so high. Mm -hmm. you know, like We're way up on the top of the mountain and there's this amazing spring. Well, I've, it, that is weird to me. I've found it, even in the Elkhorns, there's like a few springs that are like on the top of a mountain. Yeah. Like why does the water come out right here? The top, yeah. <laughs> you don't really know. Coming down, top, yeah. It come out at the bottom, but but it doesn't for some reason. We brought them up the county road to the bottom of of Price Gulch, which is on the other side of this first big hill. Mm -hmm. And within three days, those yearlings came all the way up Price Gulch, over the top into the head of Smith Creek, found this open gate climbed up this hill to the road, took the road all the way around Chonk and Peace, peeked past the bus, and down into Dexter Creek where they didn't walk. Right. Because they, yearlings will travel way more than horses will, too. You put horses in here, they'll travel and check out every mile of gate and fence and everything. There's clearly not enough grass. Yeah. 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 Them, so exactly. So that's, <laughs> so that's your neighbor or that's not your neighbor? Across the fence. Across the fence is someone else's land, but we wrecked it. We leased it. Oh, so that gate can be open. Yeah. <clears throat> yes. This is a beautiful little bowl here. It is too. Pretty cool. Pretty nice view of Baldy. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. Everybody Everybody's got a Baldy. Right? <laughs> Gotta have a Baldy somewhere. <laughs> He's talking about that mountain up there. Came all the way up here. We just looked at it. We've gone up about 1,250 feet or so from uh, the, his house where he lives in Highwood there. You can see where there's been some cows up here, even though they're not. Oh, I'm sorry. The dog's crapping. Something busted through this fence right here. The one, the one wire is broken. So can't leave that because the cows will just walk right through that. Or the younger calves. Calves will walk through, right through that. All right, so we he just put he just put a new piece right here, and you just bend it around, make two loops, and you connect it in there with a, a new piece of wire. Now this isn't very tight, but with the way this fence is, you wouldn't want to. A lot of this mountain fence, you wouldn't want to really tighten it. There's not enough ground really holding these posts in. When you're standing on top of something like this, you can just see. So far, if it was a clear day, you could probably see 70 miles that way. Of course, this is the Highwood Mountain Range right here. And then over that direction is east. So that's toward, toward uh, what would be out? There's nothing out there. <laughs> Fort Peck, I guess. And then over that way is norther. Northerly, you can see probably 60, 70 miles that way. Absolutely incredible. There's eagles below me. You probably can't see that. It's hard to see in this when I take this camera because it's such a wide angle. Now keeping fences up in the mountains is really difficult to do. 
So, I mean, the fence is here. This one looks like it's fairly new. And you can't even see where they, where they've torn up the ground at all to do it. So fences is why you'd have a hard time replacing cattle in the mountains. I, I'm gonna talk to um, the American Prairie Organization to, to kind of see their vision. I wanted to hear their vision about um, buffalo, reintroducing buffalo into lots of different areas. They're doing that mostly on private land, but they're starting to lease public land and remove the fences. Now that was a, a special thing and it's got a lot of people upset about how, you know, money d d makes it so you don't have to follow rules. So I want to find out about that. Like, what is their vision of that? How do they get that through? Is it good or bad? Who knows? I don't, I don't like to take an opinion on that kind of stuff because I'm really not sure. I don't understand Buffalo well enough to, to say, oh, they're, it's way better to have Buffalo on the land or it's way better to have cattle on the land. I just know that cattle ranchers, or cattle are not bad for the environment. They're not bad for the mountains. If you look at this, and it's very true, these mountains here, see all the grass in there? unbelievable grass all through this whole valley now <clears throat> this grass is tall and it's headed out so headed out means that it's got a seed head on it like this so it's kind of done growing and it loses a little bit of its nutrients they go back into the roots which is what makes it grow again if you chop it off or helps it grow again so really large ungulates are the ones who really knock down this grass like this they knock it down they eat the tops off they stomp it into the dirt and everything the new growth is what elk and deer like well along with forbs so elk and deer actually like to browse more than gray so they like the little the little leafy plants around as well so but if you get that new growth of grass in there that's actually what elk like to eat they don't really like to eat necessarily this long grass. If you have tall grass like this, and you have a pasture where the cattle have already been, the elk will go to that the pasture the cattle have been because it's got that new growth, that little new growth in there. They like, they prefer that. So in, in before the, the, so what cattle have really done then is taken the place of the largest ungulate, which is buffalo. So before buffalo covered all of this, right and they ranged over it and the elk would then follow them apparently and i'm just saying that and saying apparently because they do it to cattle which is are the replacement ungulate in this environment um for the grasses and i think a lot of times people think in terms of an animal so they're thinking save the wolves save the grizzly bears save the buffalo save something but they, they have a hard time thinking about the overall health of the ecosystem as a whole. The ecosystem as a whole starts at the, at the dirt level. How healthy is the ground? How healthy is the grass? What grasses are present? What forbs are present? How do you keep those forbs from being overgrazed and destroyed? How do you keep the right amount of timber? Because timber is not just a one, like more timber is always better. Here, we have more timber now than we've had in the last hundred years. And so it's taking up a lot of the resource of water. So all of that has to be taken in consideration, not just one thing. Now, people like make a lot of money off of that one thing. They'll pull at your heartstrings about how the poor wolf is not doing well or something. But you got to look at this, in, you got to look closer because 90%, 99% of that is all about money. All of that well, we need more timber. We need, it in, at least up here in the, in the West, in Montana, the grizzly bear and wolf thing has been a money-making proposition. And so has climate change. Climate change is about making money for attorneys. Um, this last case where the, those kids sued Montana, it wasn't really the kids that sued Montana at all. That was just a publicity stunt in my mind entirely because the organization behind those kids was 34 activist lawyers who according to the paper 
have raised over $20 million over the, over the course of the last few years. And this is the first time they've ever gotten a case to go to trial. So they're just making money. I mean, yeah, I understand they're probably activists that have been raised and trained in their environments, which are, none of them are from Montana. They're all from places like Oregon, New York, New Jersey, places like that. No idea, a practical sense of how the entire ecosystem works together here. And they're dealing with one thing, climate change, and just applying that as a blanket statement to everything. Instead of actually understanding how many trees do what, how to take care of a forest so it doesn't burn, how to do things that manage the ecosystem that you're in. And that includes the plant life, the dirt, the soil content, the timber, and then the animals that are on it. And the animals have an effect on the plant life and the timber and the, the health of the ecosystem all the way down to the dirt. So until you look at that thing as a whole, which is very difficult to do, you can't say, oh, we need more of this animal or we need less of that animal if you're not taking anything else into consideration but your heartstrings or your opinions. That's my rant for today. <laughs> it's so weird to think that you see all these beautiful flowers here. I mean, you got this one, you got those purple ones and this one here. And these ones right here, they're beautiful. Look at that, beautiful. But when you really look at it, you know, it's not like this is an invasive species. It's just that it's toxic. So looking at something and how it feels or what how pretty it is does not tell you the true worth of what you're looking at. And we're going into this one tomorrow? Um, the bottom of this one? Yeah, we'll go put everything that we don't put in the forest. We'll go in the bottom of the Lehman Place on the county road. For the gotcha. Day. And then they'll work their way all up through here. Up through here. <clears throat> yeah, this is this is probably quite a gather. So I only have to go over the fence from here to the county road. Well, so only that? Miles. What is that, four miles <laughs> or something? Sometimes. No. Nope. Hold my son. I'm like, fence all summer, man. And then when you're playing football, oh, you man. grab a guy by the pads, he's not going to get away from you. He'd be able to grip like nobody's business. Uh -huh. Disappointed that neither one of you could find corn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> doing. We're at about a 45 degree angle, so I'm trying to hang on so I don't sit in everybody's lap over here. <laughs> Hands and feet inside the right. Exactly. Right. The gate is shut. Look at that. So we drove we drove all the way up here on this mountain just to check this gate. Because uh, if it's open, that would mean that we put them in one end and they just go out the other end. Cow. Yeah, that's a little drop off there. We'll, we'll keep it on. The so we don't want we don't want Scott to you know. Take another. Well, and the winch is on the front, so if three we go inches. Off, we should yeah, back off the hill. probably should back off. But the gate is is closed, so we don't even have to get out for that. That's but good. They, they should stay in here. Trouble. So today we've covered a few of the thousand things that colleges missed about nature. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure you go down below. Make sure you let me know in the comments. Hit that like button. Next week's episode, we're going to jump on a horse and sort pears to go to the forest. And if you don't know what that means then you're gonna to get to learn a whole new jargon on next week's episode, which will be released next Sunday, 11 a.m. I'll see you there.